Today's lecture will cover uh, a subset on methods. Uh, there is no PowerPoint presentation for this uh, lecture. I'll be using the document camera for this. I'll start first by going to the WebCT site uh, to show you a link from which uh, there are several chapters that are useful in uh, reading and studying in a bit more detail and reinforcing the information on the methods uh, from this lecture and a few other lectures uh, prior to this and subsequent to this. Uh, then uh, we'll uh, begin the lecture that will cover um, basically the molecular and cellular approaches to studying uh, the promoter region for genes and a little bit about um, uh, studies on the genes themselves, how we would uh, approach that methodologically. We will see it in some of the research articles and the uh, chapters that I'll uh, lead you to in just a moment. Uh, I haven't yet, uh, at the time of recording this lecture, found a, a nice review article or uh, website or anything that uh, discusses this in any detail. Uh, but we will see these methods in some of the research articles uh, and uh, the abstracts, basically, that we will be using for uh, the lectures on the details, especially of the HPG axis. But some of them will come out in our studies of the other axes uh, that uh, immediately follow the uh, discussions on methods. So I'm going to switch to the computer now first to uh, show you the link that I'm talking about uh, today. Let's not forget endotext. This will be useful uh, when we uh, finish the methods and go on to the next section. Uh, so uh, start uh, going there and just looking at some of the chapters. I'll uh, cue you to those when the time comes. And I sure do hope all these materials are available for an eternity so that we uh, uh, will always have them available in the future too. Uh, this is the link that I'm uh, going to take you to right now. It's uh, the ACNP, the uh, American uh, College of Neuropsychopharmacology. Uh, it's a psychopharmacology textbook, actually, online that they have provided. <clears throat> so this is that website. And there are many, many chapters uh, on this website. Let's see if I can get it to scroll down. It goes on for uh, what seems to be an eternity. We will not use uh, even a small fraction of these. Uh, there's just some of the first ones that we're uh, going to use. <clears throat> what I have done is I printed out this screen and I've highlighted in orange uh, the chapters that we will be uh, using. So I'll switch over to the document camera uh, for this part of the uh, discussion. Let me just uh, zoom in. So the first one that we'll be doing is actually the referred to as the second chapter, Basic Concepts and Techniques of Molecular Genetics. Uh, you'll find that useful relative to what we're discussing now. And when we go on to talk about DNA and RNA methods uh, in general uh, that are different from what we're going to discuss today. The cytology and, and circuitry uh, has uh, uh, discussions of the methods that were in the prior lecture on immunocytochemistry and in situ hybridization. Uh, the critical analysis of neurochemical methods for monitoring a neurotransmitter. The printer cut it off there, but uh, I think you can see the one. That's uh, for an upcoming lecture uh, in methods on, uh, obviously, the neurochemistry methods. Uh, electrophysiology, although we don't have a separate methods lecture on electrophysiology, we've been covering it uh, throughout. So uh, let's uh, keep that in mind. You might want to go and read that over uh, just to... Um, help reinforce some of that uh, information because we'll see a bit more of the neurophysiology even though we've seen most of it already. Another one, uh, signal transduction pathways for catecholamine receptors uh, covers uh, uh, information relevant uh, to the, I've forgotten now if it's uh, chapter 9 or chapter 10 that covers the receptors, but uh, relevant to the information in the textbook gives a bit more detail uh, and uh, supportive information and some figures uh, that you certainly will want to take a look at. Anytime you see figures, now I'm sure you're beginning to uh, tune in that you want to uh, read them over. Uh, you've also seen that I take excerpts from the text and ask you to interpret that. 
So we're definitely moving away from uh, the rote memorization uh, approach to uh, testing, uh, even though in the, the uh, prior exam, uh, the, uh, uh, what was it, test two, <clears throat> um, I took the question straight from the textbook and had you fill in the blanks. Uh, we'll be moving away from that even more as we proceed. Here's two that are not uh, so relevant for methods, but certainly for the upcoming discussions on the HPA axis, corticotropin releasing factor, physiology and pharmacology and role uh, in the central nervous system. Uh, obviously some of the titles cut off here, but uh, we won't really focus on the immune disorders as we had said at the beginning of the semester, but this one covers the hypothalamic releasing hormone uh, and its receptor down to the level of the gene in many of the cases. So remember, that's the level that we're going to proceed to uh, in the upcoming discussions of the HPA axis. The HPT axis, you can find uh, a great deal of information on the TRH uh, at this site. So those are not for methods, as I said, uh, but I just wanted to mention them in passing because coming very soon, uh, we'll be discussing that as well. There's one on luteinizing hormone, releasing hormone, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, neuronal systems. Uh, of course, we call this GNRH, uh, but these authors still refer to it as the LHRH. Very interesting chapter, uh, a lot of detailed information, many figures uh, of administering different types of uh, analogs of GNRH uh, in humans and interactions with steroids. Um, you, you definitely want to look that one over. I'm going to dig into that one uh, to supplement our lectures and definitely for uh, evaluation material, hint, hint, right? Uh, this one on proto-oncogenes beyond the second messengers will be very important as well. Not quite so much methodologically, but I would like you to go and read it over under the discussion of methods because uh, it focuses on transcription factors that really have been discovered from studying the proto-oncogenes. So that'll be very interesting. We've already seen a list of some of the proto-oncogenes, the MYC or Mike, uh, the CFOS and the CJUNE uh, and things like that. So uh, it is a, a source uh, to refer to that and help understand uh, what we're going to discuss uh, today even. And then uh, the molecular analysis of single cell importance uh, is uh, I think the final one no, there's, there's one more. <clears throat> um, but this one on the uh, molecular analysis of single cell importance uh, is really quite interesting and uh, it will be relevant to information we are uh, discussing. And then, let's see, then the final one is this, the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Uh, it has a lot of information, several formula, uh, and, it, and uh, several figures that discuss uh, binding assay results uh, about receptor pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. We do have a portion of a lecture, probably will end up being a single lecture, dedicated to this. Uh, we are not expecting ourselves to become experts in this, but it, I think it's essential in the type of course that we're studying here that we uh, focus on that and develop some skills there. Just looking for the camera. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to try to move the camera over so it's centered on me since now I'm going to switch to the lecture that will be uh, all from the, uh, the document camera here. So this lecture, as I said, is going to fo focus primarily on um, understanding transcription factors and uh, promoter regions, so what methods are used to analyze and evaluate uh, this important portion of uh, the DNA that uh, comes, as we know, before or upstream uh, to the genes that we are considering as targets uh, for uh, many of the components of the neuroendocrine axes and their target cells that we're studying. Uh, it's uh, important to understand this because, as you recall from the very beginning of the semester, uh, I got all psyched and excited about differential gene expression, uh, developmental gene expression, uh, alterations of gene expression through aging, through the sleep-wake cycle uh, throughout a, a day, certainly throughout other biological rhythms such as the menstrual cycle. 
as we will see in that uh, chapter on LHRH is a very interesting one relative to that. Uh, and then also, of course, we've talked about cell-specific, tissue-specific, organ-specific uh, gene expression, and <clears throat> all of these aspects of differential gene expression regulation are really uh, related to understanding the promoter region of a gene. So I'm going to go to this figure. It's quite small in the publication and even quite small uh, here, but I'll zoom in on certain parts of it uh, to uh, explain it. This will be a nice introduction to what we're going to discuss. This comes from the, the chapter on the proto-oncogenes. And uh, first what I will do is uh, zoom in on these proto-oncogene uh, products, transcription factors. Uh, you see the title of this is the stimulus uh, transcription uh, coupling. So it is consistent with the studies on the, um, the uh, neurotransmitter and neuropeptide receptor mechanisms. So here we see a, a list of different uh, transcription, uh, transcription factors. Some of the immediate early genes, the CFOS and CJUN. Uh, I'll talk about these uh, in just uh, a moment. We'll do some general introductory information to get an understanding for how some of these transcription factor genes are regulated uh, and then proceed from there. And we know that they're, uh, after they're activated, transcription factors, uh, even the ligand-dependent ones uh, for the steroid, hormone as the steroid hormones as their receptors, uh, they form either heterodimers or homodimers, uh, and then they're capable of binding to the DNA. So here we recognize CREB, C-R-H-E-B, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the, the P on here is for the protein, obviously, and so there must be isoforms. So this is cyclic AMP response element binding protein 1. We see uh, June, June B, June again, June, June homodimer, uh, FRA and June, and a FOS June, a uh, couple of different um, uh, heterodimers in there as well. Even this June, June B, since there are different isoforms, is considered a heteromer. Uh, the uh, CFOS and CJUN up here will also uh, form uh, heterodimeric uh, transcription factor complexes that can bind to the DNA. We can see that this collection of transcription factors can bind to two different consensus sequences on promoter regions. <clears throat> the AP1 site, as we recall, was related to the JUN-FOS uh, families. This uh, FRA is a FOS-related antigen, uh, so obviously in, in searching out different peptides uh, from the nuclei studying uh, proto-oncogenes, uh, the FOS feline osteo osteosarcoma was found early, and then some other peptides related to it that had similar antigenicity came up, so they were referred to as uh, FOS-related antigens. A few different isoforms of these, so we are generalizing here. But the FOS June uh, groups uh, are the ones that target the AP1 site, uh, and the AP1 consensus sequence is TGA, CTCA. The CRE site for binding when the uh, CREB is involved is the TGA, CGT, uh, CA. So these will be the sequences that I'll ask you to recognize for the AP1 site and the CRE site, even though they were listed on a different table uh, previously. And what becomes important is, of course, the term consensus sequence. Uh, and in <clears throat> uh, the origin of that term is that um, when um, this uh, AP, again, I forget what the acronym stands for, but it's a, an acronym for a drug, is added to cells that certain genes will increase their expression, and it's dependent upon this uh, consensus sequence in the uh, promoter regions of the uh, affected genes. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, every time they studied the genes of the gene products or the messenger RNAs that were increased, when cells were exposed uh, to this drug, this sequence always showed up in the promoter region, so it was a consensus sequence uh, for that uh, type of a transcription uh, event. And then uh, as well, the same here. So once these consensus sequences are established, then uh, you can look for those sequences 
in the promoter regions of genes, and uh, that'll help us transition on over to the, uh, the discussion that we're going to have. So this, this figure takes us through a variety of mechanisms for activating these uh, proto-oncogenes, these transcription factors. So we see calcium as a second messenger. We discussed that in great detail. Certainly some of the uh, classical neurotransmitters here, acetylcholine and excitatory amino acids like glutamate as we discussed, uh, hormones and growth factors and other neurotransmitters uh, in general, each having different uh, types of receptors uh, uh, represented here. So you should uh, recognize uh, if this is the G coupled, that should be seven transmembrane spanning segments there. The single transmembrane spanning segment of the growth hormone and, and uh, growth factors and hormone receptors that act through this type of tyrosine kinase uh, like receptor, ligand gated ion channels, um, <clears throat> and uh, the calcium channel. Since you see this one is a ligand guided ligand gated uh, ion channel and you see acetylcholine there, you should automatically know that this is the nicotinic cholinergic receptor because the muscarinic receptor is uh, of the G-coupled uh, subtype. Uh, let's just go through this uh, early um, activation of the immediate early genes and their gene products uh, for a moment. <clears throat> Uh, actually, uh, these are the immediate early genes. The proteins that would be produced ultimately by translation would be their immediate early gene products, the uh, transcription factors that are, would be ready to be activated. <clears throat> so in cell signaling, you get the transmembrane cell transduction through some mechanism. Uh, and we'll see uh, what the example we'll use is uh, adenylate cyclase with cyclic AMP activating CREB and CREB targeting the CRE on these uh, uh, promoter regions of these immediate early genes. <clears throat> that is a very early event within uh, matters of seconds, actually. That's why uh, it's called an immediate early gene. <clears throat> and these get trans uh, transcribed. The uh, message is processed and sent to the cytoplasm for translation. Uh, the inactive uh, transcription factors uh, are then present there. They require some phosphorylization, uh, forming of the heterodimer or homodimeric portions, and then they have permission to enter the nucleus, and they translocate to the nucleus uh, to uh, diffuse around and somehow magically, <laughs> introduce that term there, seems like it sometimes, uh, find their consensus sequences on uh, the, uh, and bind to it uh, and regulate the target gene expression. So let's uh, now begin to talk about the immediate early genes before we start talking about methods used to study uh, the uh, promoter regions. So as we said, there are very early on for gene expression, Oh, we got to zoom out for this. There we go. For gene expression, we had talked about constitutive, <clears throat> and uh, an example we'll use here would be the uh, the Krebs gene. Krebs is uh, always present within cells and has to be phosphorylated to become activated. So its inactive form is in the unphosphorylated form, uh, and when it becomes phosphorylated, it is then active, can form uh, the heterodimers and bind to the CRE. So we remember that this is on at a basal level, can be increased and decreased, it can be regulated or modulated, whatever term you want to throw at it. And then there's uh, inducible genes. <clears throat> so these are uh, the uh, off on type of a, a situation. They're either not expressed or they are expressed. And they can be expressed strongly and persistently or <clears throat> um, uh, at a slightly lower but still detectable levels um, and maybe not for quite as long. So I don't want everyone to think that they can only go to a certain level and can't be expressed any farther. We realize that there can be degrees of the regulation, but under basal conditions, they are not expressed. And uh, uh, 
<clears throat> one of the groups that we want to talk about are the immediate early genes. <clears throat> the uh, abbreviation for this is the IEG. So the IEGs, and we saw that the, the FOSS <clears throat> and the uh, June, and again, you'll have to look in the uh, proto-oncogene literature to find out what these stand for, uh, as long as we can recognize them and realize that they bind to the AP1 consensus sequence, we'll be uh, hanging in there just fine. So these are two examples of immediate early genes. There are others, but these are the two uh, that I know enough about to discuss and that we want to think about to uh, develop our understanding of their importance. Let's then jump to a nucleus and think about the CFOS gene. It obviously is going to have introns and exons as shown in that illustration. <clears throat> and it's the promoter region that we're interested in. So uh, it's known that there is a CRE a consensus sequence for the uh, cyclic AMP response element uh, binding uh, protein to bind to it. <clears throat> so this is the early gene, or the IEG, the immediate early gene. <clears throat> and uh, we now need to think of another gene that would be, can be referred to as the late gene. And regardless of what this gene is, I'm going to call it uh, CRH, because I know the CRH gene does have a consensus sequence on it. So the question asked is, what consensus sequence would you predict would have to be here in order for this uh, gene product ultimately to affect the expression of this gene? Obviously, the AP1 site. So the early gene... Uh, is activated through the mechanisms that we saw. Could be, uh, <clears throat> well, we got to get outside the nucleus here, right? And uh, to the cytoplasmic membrane, get a G-coupled uh, protein, excuse me, a G-coupled receptor that's coupled to adenylate cyclase, get the cyclic AMP. <clears throat> cyclic AMP uh, activates uh, protein kinase uh, A, <clears throat> A for the cyclic AMP, uh, PKA phosphorylates uh, the CREB, <clears throat> and the CREB can form the heterodimer, as we said before, bind to the CRE and trigger transcription of the CFOS gene. Ultimately, its messenger RNA is made. Exits the nucleus, of course. You get translation, as we saw. <clears throat> and then the, the CFOS protein gene product uh, is now available, becomes phosphorylated, and has, let's get our nucleus back here with a nuclear pore. <clears throat> After the CFOS is phosphorylated, uh, it and forms the, uh, a dimer of some type, as we saw in the previous uh, illustration, translocates to the nucleus and uh, then can bind to the AP1 site and affect the transcription of the late gene. So our focus on this discussion is early gene, late gene. This is a target gene of this gene product. <clears throat> so whatever the stimulus was coming to the cell is targeting uh, the, uh, in this example, the CRH gene. Now what's also known is that uh, there is a CRE on the CRH gene. <clears throat> so this CREB from the original signal can actually uh, affect the CR CRH gene uh, very early on. And the interesting aspect of this example is that <clears throat> uh, very early on the studies of CFOS uh, were performed and obviously they're called immediate early genes uh, and uh, <clears throat> under stressful conditions, we uh, would predict that the CRH system would be activated, get a, a significant or robust release of CRH, uh, 
And we now know whenever we hear release, we think of synthesis to replace what was released. It's neuropeptide, so it's dependent on transcription and translation back at the soma, <clears throat> so we understand that. And uh, we would expect that synthesis would have to be activated within a very short period of time. And <clears throat> the uh, temporal pattern of the appearance of the CFOS messenger RNA and the CFOS uh, protein, <clears throat> especially the time point, and I'll do a time scale of this in just a moment, a timeline uh, of its presence uh, within the nucleus, <clears throat> everyone thought that CFOS was really the, the responsible uh, transcription factor for inducing the immediate increase in CRH gene expression. And then later when uh, CREB became the, the popular transcription factor, it was discovered that uh, it is activated in the CRH neurons <clears throat> um, and uh, found in the phosphorylated form within the nucleus uh, even earlier than the CFOS protein uh, can get there. So even before the CFOS gene uh, messenger RNA is detected, uh, the, the CREB is present in the nucleus, and therefore that's how we uh, understand that it <clears throat> uh, can uh, be one of the primary triggers for inducing Remember, this is the inducible gene for inducing the uh, de novo expression of the CFOS gene. So de novo <clears throat> means uh, of new or uh, brand new. So going from a zero level of expression to on a level of expression, <clears throat> uh, the uh, inducible type of a gene. <clears throat> so we know the CREB is there very early on. And now the question we have to ask is how do we know that the CRE is on the CRH gene, or that the AP1 is on the CRH gene, or that the CRE is on the CFOS gene. How <clears throat> could that information uh, have been extracted from uh, biological samples? And that leads us into uh, the discussion uh, that will uh, come uh, generically, and we'll just kind of use this as an example uh, to help with that. <clears throat> but let me do the timeline for the uh, <clears throat> the uh, CFOS gene induction. So if this is zero time, uh, and this is one hour, and this is a half an hour, so this would be 60 minutes. That's minutes there, my dot and my N joined together. <laughs> minutes, <laughs> oh, it looks horrible. Can't leave it like that, M-I-N. So in minutes, so this is 30 minutes and uh, 120 minutes, and then on out to, let's say, 48 hours. I know I changed my scale there, but uh, we want to get out to a long uh, period of time. So we've got a change in the scale uh, component here, 24 hours uh, and 48 hours, so one day uh, and two days. <clears throat> so within um, really just about 10 minutes, you have, you can detect the messenger RNA, and again this is for CFOS. <clears throat> so that one is uh, showing the mRNA in the cytoplasm. So in 10 minutes, you can detect, within 10 minutes of a stimulus, you can detect significant levels of CFOS messenger RNA uh, in the cytoplasm. Within 30 minutes to one hour, you have CFOS protein. I'll put GP for gene product. Now, of course, the message is still persisting. The message, depending upon the stimulus, the, the message can persist uh, for up to uh, maybe um, like three to four hours, in some cases six to eight hours uh, after for the CFOS mRNA. So it really depends upon the stimulus. So that's what I was saying. Uh, you might get more message within a short period of time, and it might persist for a longer period of time, but it's still going from off to on, but there is a modulation uh, of the degree of on, how rapidly will you get uh, trans transcription occurring, uh, 
and for how long might it persist? <clears throat> uh, the, the gene product, the FOS protein, <clears throat> at two hours, I need to clarify the other one, <clears throat> at the uh, 30 minutes to one hour, you'll find the FOS protein in, in the cytoplasm. My graph is getting really <laughs> clogged up here. <laughs> Should have made it larger. <clears throat> so with up to uh, within 10 minutes, you can detect message. Go from undetectable to detectable levels of message in the cytoplasm. Uh, <clears throat> within uh, uh, 30 minutes to an hour, you can detect the gene product, the protein in the cytoplasm. So within 30 minutes of the stimulus, we have uh, transcription and translation uh, occurring. <clears throat> By two hours, uh, the CFOS has completed its activation uh, and <clears throat> is in the biologically active form, phosphorylated, and in the dimer form, and is in the nucleus. <clears throat> and actually, uh, the appearance, if I can just quickly draw a cell here with its nucleus, uh, the nucleus goes from no staining when you're using immunocytochemistry to stain for the CFOS protein to really just being a solid dark staining color. It almost seems like the entire nucleus fills with the CFOS protein within two hours. It's really quite a phenomenal observation. And this is of course what led the scientists early on to think that the CFOS was the immediate early gene that was responsible for upregulating the CRH gene expression uh, during uh, a stressful event. <clears throat> then typically by 24 hours, uh, the, certainly the messenger RNA is gone and uh, the uh, CFOS protein is gone. The CFOS protein uh, may be all gone somewhere around 16 hours even. <clears throat> certainly by 24 hours, the CFOS protein is gone and it's somewhere in this 16 to 24 hours and definitely out to the 48 hours that you can begin to detect the late gene product, the protein of the target gene. <clears throat> so the CRH molecule itself will be detected uh, within one day <clears throat> of the stimulus. Now the, the, the timeline for the late gene expression when would you see message <clears throat> and when would you see the protein <clears throat> differs in different cellular systems. And uh, we need to clarify, I use the example of the CRH here, what happened in, in the studies when they started monitoring the CRH messenger RNA and gene product levels, they were uh, increasing way back here within 10 minutes or 30 minutes they were getting an increase in CRH message in the cytoplasm you know, and within an hour or so, uh, the CRH peptide was uh, detected um, in the mature uh, functional form. So what this told uh, scientists, of course, the astute scientists, what the, it was that there was an, a temporal incongruity uh, between the immediate early gene uh, expression and the late gene expression. So there had to be some other transcription factor responsible for the early response, whoops, the early response of the, the CH gene, and of course it turned out to be the uh, cyclic AMP dependent uh, CREB binding to the CRE very early on within the same time pattern as for the CFOS gene transcription uh, to regulate the CRH gene. <clears throat> so this is just an example of how we can uh, kind of piece this together and dissect the data and end up uh, finding incongruencies uh, and uh, how data <clears throat> uh, ultimately uh, will no longer support a hypothesis and the hypothesis even has to be altered uh, to incorporate the, the new interpretation of the completer set, the more complete set of data. <clears throat> but let's now ask the question, first how could we know that either of these two uh, genes uh, had uh, a, a sequence of DNA in their promoter region uh, 
that could even bind to the transcription factors, and much less how would it be active. So what this comes down to is a discussion of promoter analysis. So what are the methodological approaches for promoter analysis? First, of course, you sequence it. And what we know in order to sequence it, 1A, if you will, you have to isolate it. And we'll talk about how you isolate it and then sequencing. We're not going to get into a discussion of any details on that. We know that somehow, magically, they can come up with the sequence of the promoter of any length of DNA. Then second is to determine the binding capabilities. And of course, this is binding of the transcription factors. And then third is whether it is functional. So this is the case for any biological, you know, chemical interaction that you want to think about. You have to know basically the structure of the two molecules that are binding together and verify that they can bind to each other. And then keep in mind that binding does not mean functional response as an outcome of the binding. So there has to be some type of functional assay. So the first one then, the promoter analysis, the sequence, you have to isolate it. So if we think of the CRH gene again, I think it was one of the hypothalamic hormones that came right on the cusp of the development, final development of the utility of molecular methods, the recombinant DNA approaches for finding the genes for the neuropeptides. In the past, of course, what was performed was that you had to have the gene product first. So once you've got the gene product, product, which is a protein, my brain's writing what I'm thinking rather than what I wanted to write. So once you've got the gene product, and really it was the hunt for the CRH that took a tremendous amount of time. It was the first one identified biologically and the last one virtually to be sequenced, to be isolated and characterized. So you have to isolate the gene product, get the amino acid sequence, and then of course predict the DNA sequence from that. So this was the approach early on, and of course you would predict the DNA sequence, but you would have no information really on the number of exons and certainly wouldn't have any sequence for the introns. So the recombinant DNA technology, of course, allowed the utilization of portions of the sequence of the homologous DNA to mix with DNA from whole cells, basically to pull out candidate DNA output pieces. So if you have some portion of the predicted DNA sequence and you mix it with the nuclear DNA that's extracted and digested 
uh, to some degree, then you can pull out what has been hybridized uh, to your probe, if you will, and then begin to sequence that. And ultimately, you can uh, end up with the entire uh, gene sequence so you know all of the, the gene, at least certainly up to the, the TATA box in this area to get the, the zero. So this approach that we just talked about, starting with the gene protein and getting to a predicted DNA sequence, uh, <clears throat> ultimately with the new methodologies, the recombinant DNA, uh, allowed pulling out the entire gene or the candidate uh, gene DNA pieces <clears throat> uh, and then just begin sequencing them uh, and uh, working with it there uh, finally to verify what the, the sequence was. Once you've got the, the gene for uh, a gene product of interest, then you can begin sequencing the DNA upstream from the start site on the actual gene itself. <clears throat> and this is uh, where our story begins. Uh, in cases where you, you have the functional gene and you, you have to have the, the functional gene to know where to start to isolate and uh, sequence uh, upstream of that when you're pulling out bigger and bigger pieces uh, of DNA uh, from the cell through the same approach. You, <laughs> you have probes that will stick to the CRH gene and pull that out of your solution and then you begin uh, your sequencing uh, from the TATA box uh, upstream. <clears throat> so uh, let's ask the question, uh, how many uh, nucleotide uh, base pairs or bases uh, upstream are in a promoter region? So here's where you make your guesses. Is it 10? Is it 100? <clears throat> well, we'll see in some cases they, they investigate all the way up to about 5,000 uh, <clears throat> nucleic acid uh, residues. So these can be quite large, uh, and, uh, and they may even be longer than this. It's just it seems that uh, this big of a chunk of DNA is somewhat difficult to work with, uh, uh, especially with the approaches that uh, we're going to talk about uh, next. So uh, once you've got it, you sequence it, and then uh, I'm sure there's uh, software that does all the searching for you. You just look for uh, the uh, consensus sequences. Consensus. So the, I'm sure the databases are available now in the uh, search engines so that it will pull out a long list of these. Early on in some of the research that we'll see, they look for particular ones or suspect or candidate consensus sequences because they had some idea. I would expect now that you can get an entire list and then look for the ones of interest <clears throat> and begin proceeding from there. So this would mean that uh, if a consensus sequence for a transcription factor shows up on the list, then you have a candidate target gene for a transcription factor. That's all that you can conclude from this. That it's a candidate gene, excuse me, target gene for a particular transcription factor. Now you notice that we didn't call it a, uh, <clears throat> a late gene, we just called it a target gene. Uh, this is the generic term. A late gene is a target gene for immediate early genes. <clears throat> so now we have uh, done the sequencing and we have candidate uh, consensus sequences for uh, the, our suspected transcription factors. So what method do we use to study the binding capabilities? 
and the only one I'm going to discuss is the uh, the DNA uh, shift assay. And in, in this case, uh, we have our candidate uh, DNA. the promoter region, or it might be just some portion of that promoter region. <clears throat> we might not have to work with all 5,000. We might be able to just pull out the portion. Uh, and their upstream is, uh, remember, it's a numerical scale. So uh, downstream from the uh, start site, they are positively numbered uh, base pairs. And upstream, they are negative. So maybe we just are going to study uh, negative uh, 1,000 to negative 500 because within there we have our <coughs> sequence, our consensus sequence. So if we take this portion of DNA, whatever it is that we work with, then uh, <coughs> we run it on a gel and it should go a, a certain distance depending upon the molecular uh, uh, properties of that uh, piece of DNA. We all know that. So if we uh, applied them to the gel here and they move in this direction, so the, um, the, as the farther away from the site of application you get, uh, the, uh, the lower the molecular weight. <clears throat> right? So the ones that move the farthest uh, have the the greatest capability to move through your gel. So that's lane one. In lane two, we have added our, some of our DNA with an appropriate or predicted amount of our candidate transcription factor, and it only moves to here. This tells us that the, you know, there's been a shift in the motility, uh, <clears throat> the mobility, excuse me, uh, there's been a shift in the mobility of the piece of DNA that we put on. It's now a bigger molecule because DNA is stuck to it. <clears throat> now, obviously, if you have an antibody to the transcription factor, remember we said we, we have a known transcription factor, so it's a protein, we can have antibodies uh, generated to it. <clears throat> then you can use the antibodies uh, to uh, approach uh, it in this fashion. <clears throat> you can mix the, the DNA that you have and the transcription factor, give it time to uh, associate and bind, uh, <clears throat> separate bound from unbound, then use the antibody uh, to detect uh, your transcription factor that's bound to your uh, DNA. <clears throat> uh, and so it's through these types of uh, procedures, either just doing the, the DNA shift assay itself, looking at the, the DNA in the gel, or using antibodies to look at the presence of the transcription factor. Also, uh, with the DNA in this gel, <clears throat> it'd be absent here and present there, uh, as we would predict. You can determine that your consensus sequence is capable of binding the candidate uh, transcription factor. Now, where I want to transition that just quickly to a functional assay, <clears throat> and we'll uh, have to have a, a separate lecture on the uh, remaining part of the, uh, the functional assay as our time is running down. So I will uh, discuss this in greater detail. But since we've talked about binding, I, I want to talk about one example of evaluating cells um, after a stimulus to determine <clears throat> if uh, binding has uh, occurred. So I already mentioned that uh, within two hours, the nucleus will fill with CFOS. Well, that's great. You have no way of knowing that the CFOS protein that you now detect in the nucleus of this uh, stimulated cell is doing anything. So we ask the question, is this CFOS uh, in this cell <clears throat> binding to the AP1 uh, site? So there's a way of isolating the DNA and assessing uh, how much of the AP1 site is occupied. <clears throat> 
and I'm not going to try to go into any great detail in that, but we see the transition still under uh, the binding capabilities, <clears throat> but uh, moving on to functional, where we answer the next question. Transcription factors in the, in the nucleus, and we ask the question, is a, are there a, a greater proportion of the AP1 consensus sequence sites bound by something? So there's a way of assessing the proportion of bound or occupied and unoccupied. And then, of course, if you use your antibody again, <clears throat> uh, you can you know, get an estimate of the proportion of the occupied AP1 sites that have uh, your uh, CFOS uh, bound to it. So I'm going to stop on that one, uh, and uh, we'll terminate the lecture here and pick up with the functional assays uh, in a separate lecture. Appreciate your time and attention, and look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye.